let us worship and bow down. Let us bow before the Lord our Maker. Reading together, O oh Lord, today we worship, we worship you and contemplate the meaning of your death on the cross. May we too entrust our spirits unto you and sorrow our loss. Go to dark at seven. <laughs> verses 33 to 43 from the New International Version. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice about him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hung there, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are ju punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, Truly, I tell you, 
today you will be with me in paradise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you only are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. During his earthly ministry, Jesus asked what may be the most important question ever. Looking his disciples in the eyes, he asked, 
Who do you say that I am? How each of us answers that question is worth pondering as we make our decisions for daily living, but it's especially important that we answer that question on this most solemn observance of Good Friday. From the cross, the first words Jesus spoke came after three years of ministry with followers, unable to answer that question. The words came after Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. The words came after Peter denied him to save his own skin. The words came after Jesus was put on trial, mocked, beaten, tied to the cross, with nails through his wrists and his feet. And where were his disciples? Was there anyone there to defend him? <clears throat> the company he had was two common criminals, thieves, and a jeering crowd of onlookers. And yet we must not forget the women. The women who had also been his disciples, who dared to stay at the foot of the cross, weeping as their friend died. They provided the only real source of silent love. And he did see them. But then in the midst of that ugliness and forsakenness, Jesus spoke those first words. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. It was inescapable. He had to speak those words because forgiveness is this man's very nature. He was and he is eternal love and compassion and open arms for those who still despise him and even those of us who say we love him. And we today in our constant warring and rigid judgment of those who don't look like us or speak like us or believe like us, we also are desperately in need of that forgiveness that he offers. We say and we believe that we love him, but so many of our actions deny him that love. Our fear of speaking his words of justice in the midst of injustice, that denies him. And so those words spoken from the cross are words that we desperately need to hear again and again where they acknowledge our pathetic humanness. Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they are doing. But it's his next words that I have found so deeply powerful also not only for what Jesus said, but for what he didn't say. The voices of the thieves are shouting over him as he hangs in the middle of them. One is going to his death, defiant, hardened, unrepentant, blind, mocking the Christ and challenging him, save yourself if you really are God's son. But the other one is finding the eyes of his heart opened. He hears that raucous crowd berating this man whom he doesn't even know. But he does know that he doesn't hear any hateful words of response. He simply hears silence. And in that silence, he gets a glimpse, a tiny glimpse of the goodness in this man 
and he defends him. But we are getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing. And then with the barest inkling of who Christ is, he utters a simple request. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief wasn't asking for anything but to be remembered by this silent man who indeed must have had some kind of kingdom somewhere. And for me, what is so powerful is not what Jesus said, but what he did not say that lays on my heart constantly. As we in this life are so used to labeling and judging others. Jesus didn't say, how dare you ask anything of me? You're a thief, a common thief. <laughs> he didn't ask how much can you pay the church before I do anything for you? He didn't ask if he was gay or straight or what his political party was. He didn't ask if he was Catholic or Protestant or Hebrew. He didn't ask if he was baptized. He didn't ask his ethnicity. He just responds with a greater gift than this thief could ever imagine. Today, he said, not a year from now after you've done a lot of hard work, but today, you will be with me in paradise. And then upon giving this greatest gift of unconditional love and forgiveness, Jesus' last words were heard. And it's important to note that those last words weren't a whimper of defeat or a cry of pain, but they were words shouted from the cross. They are words of triumph. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This carpenter turned teacher and rabbi knew from whence he came and where he was going. And he knew his mission was accomplished. And while he had truly felt forsaken by this father of his, he now knew there had been a plan of salvation. And he had fulfilled that plan in his death for us. So now back to that first question Jesus asked of his followers. Who do you say that I am? And in the silence of your hearts, how do you answer that? Why is this day called Good Friday? And the reason is so simple. It's because the question has changed. Now we don't need to plague ourselves with guilt and soul searching or fear of a God as we go into our dying days. We need to ponder a different question. Who does Jesus say you are? And the answer is apparent on Good Friday. You are the child God's son died to save. You are loved, you are forgiven repeatedly, even when you don't ask for that gift. And despite what may be the deepest sin in your hearts that you hide, You are a redeemed child of God who is always welcomed 
and did the crucified arms of Christ and into the promise that with this thief we will know paradise as our home also. Amen. And we take a moment of silence to ponder the meaning of this day and the questions of this day. pray. Gracious Lord, we got to confess that it was hard to be silent for even one minute. And to think about what it took you three hours to endure. And yet we do know that by your stripes we have been healed. By turning your cheek to those who persecuted you we have been set free. Your death was the price paid for our promise of eternal life. Help us never to take for granted your unconditional gift of love that has redeemed each one of us. Forgive us for being daily too busy to recognize the path of service that your death now calls us to follow also. And we thank you for saying it is finished. For now we know death has lost its sting. And we can praise you on this Good Friday and every day for making all things new. In your name we pray.
God, your son chose the path that led to pain before joy and to the cross before glory. Plant his cross in our hearts so that in his power and love we may at length come to joy and glory. Look with loving mercy upon your family for whom your son was willing to be betrayed to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. and the responsive reading, which is found on your second page. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well. Yet you are the Holy One, and enthroned upon the graces of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted in you to deliver them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, sworn by all to the spouses of my people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They they are are the saying, he trusted in the Lord, and let him deliver him. Let let him, rescue him, him if he him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. And he and he saved saved I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You are my God, and I was still my Far from me, for trouble is near, and, and there, there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong, strong bulls of destruction surround me. They open wide their jaws at me, like, like a dragon in a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a pot syrup. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can have all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast slots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Save me from the sword, my life, my life from the power of the Lord. <laughs>
seen in an opposed to me. And now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and forever. In the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose resurrection we remember. Amen. Amen.